Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Good morning, church family. My name is David Friesner, and my family and I have been members here for about six years, and we serve in the missions department as well as home group leaders. Our text this morning is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, and it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, David. Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, I would love for you to open up to that passage. I am going to cover some of the verses uh, before it uh, and kind of give you a, a kind of a broader picture of what's going on in that passage. Uh, it was almost 15 years ago uh, that I was just doing my normal kind of Bible reading plan. It was in uh, January. You know what I'm talking about, Bible reading plan? Anybody ever done one of those? Like and you did it and you're like, you, you made it? Like you read through it? Okay, anybody not? Like, man, you tried, man. But you hit that Leviticus numbers and got body slammed and, and didn't know what else to do. And then don't, don't feel anybody just like, I tried, pastor, I tried, it got me. Numbers got me. Listen, I don't want, don't feel bad about it. Just keep, keep chipping away at it, man. Life is long. The word's there for you. Just keep at it, right? Um, so I'm reading and I come across a, a very strange verse in Genesis 5, 3. There's a lot of strange verses in Genesis, but uh, I come across Genesis 5, 3, and it was, a, it was a big block reading, so I think I was like in six chapters that morning, and here's the verse. Like, you never know when the Holy Spirit's going to ambush you. You never know. Sneaky like that. Pop up in a crazy verse like this and just change your life. And, and so this is what I read. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image, and named him Seth. Selah, let's pray, I'll be done. No, They're like, right, what, huh? So, so I'm minding my own business at, 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 our, at our table, reading my Bible, and come across that verse, and here's the thought. Here, here's the thought that has brought me a, a lot of pain and a lot of joy uh, since. Um, the thought I had was, is the phrase, in his image, in his likeness, the same phrase as Genesis 1, 26 and 27. That was the, so I'm naturally curious, that's what hit my mind. Is when God, when we get the story of God creating humankind in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and the triune God of the universe says, let us make man in our likeness, in our image, and then he makes them male and female, he makes them. Is that phrase, likeness and image, is it the same in Hebrew? And so, man, I pop up in logos. I'm not getting paid to say that, but I pop up my logos and, uh, and, and kind of do a, a, a Hebrew word search. And sure enough, it's identical. Now, why, why does that matter? Here's why that matters. And here's why it's been both painful and beautiful ever since. The Imago Dei is a distinctly Judeo-Christian idea. What I mean by that is it did not exist in the world until Christendom and Western civilization took root. The Imago Dei, the idea that you and I as humankind are distinct among all of creation in that we are like God somehow, that we have a moral nature, an intellectual nature, and a spiritual nature that no other creature has 
is the foundation for every conversation that's ever been had about rights and equality. You go study, you tell me where the Assyrians had any idea uh, about human rights or equality. You show me where Rome had any idea about equality or human rights. These concepts were born of the Judeo-Christian doctrine of the Imago Dei. Whole moral law legal systems have been built on this foundation. One of the ironies of our days is those who hate Jesus Christ and hate his church actually have to use his stuff to try to accomplish what they feel they're owed, which didn't exist before God made it abundantly clear in his written word. It's, it's, it's sadly and painfully ironic. So uh, I'm, now I'm on this trail. It's just kind of how I'm built. Sometimes I hate it about me. And, and so now I'm like, okay, well, let me pull this thread because if the image that we're like God somehow is in his image and likeness, and now I've got that same thing happening when a son is born, then it appears that whatever makes us like God somehow is handed off as we have children so that our children are made in his likeness and in his image. And so now now I'm kind of moving down the the line and and, and then what starts to be clear over the course of the next year as I read through the Bible is throughout the scriptures, the scriptures unapologetically begin to teach that life begins at conception. Just what the Bible teaches, it's what the church has believed for thousands of years. It's not new, it's not novel, it's what the Bible has taught forever. And so then, because I believe that science and faith are not at odds, in fact, I think you'll start to see this if you're paying attention. Like if you come, it's like, I think sometimes science catches up to the Bible. So like, let me give you, has anybody seen like an article like this over the last couple of years? Scientists discover that taking a full day off unplugged from work actually leads to longevity and greater physical health. <laughs> anybody seen something like that? Like all the time you're like, yeah, like for 6,000 years, it's called Sabbath, <laughs> right? It, so I, I started and here's what I found that I'm not a doctor or a biologist. So I need to, need to ask questions of those who are. I found that almost all biologists, when it comes to mammals, will say life begins at conception. And then from there, I learned that a baby in the womb of a mother, by the time it's eight weeks old, sucks its thumb, recoils from being pricked. Technology shows us that we think they're dreaming now, that their hearts beat that almost all their organs are functioning. It has its own distinct DNA and its own blood type, brain waves, all of those things present by eight weeks. So then I thought, crud, I've got to say something. I can't not say something. But I I knew what it meant for me to say something. I, I knew the kind of beating you take if you step into that space. And and so, as has happened so often in my 20-something years of preaching, the Holy Spirit just said, okay, well, are you my man or are you their man? Whose man are you? And so, I was like, okay. And I put together my first sermon on life. 12 years ago, preached it in January. And and then, I, I mean, that was a long week. I think that sermon was 58 minutes long. I mean, I was just trying to nuance everything to protect myself from the impending tsunami. And braced. And it came. And so I, great, I want to learn. The only way for you to get blocked by me or shut out by me is for you to devolve the conversation and name calling and, and, and petty cursing. Because to me, you just reveal that you're a child and I'll let you go play with the other children, but I want to be a grown up. And so if we can have a conversation where maybe we disagree with one another, but can still be human, I'm game for that. But I'm telling you, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to play with children as a grown man. I want to play with mine, but like to get in an internet dialogue with with someone who wants to uh, accuse and devolve the whole thing into name calling. 
Like that's, I'm just not going to give myself over to that. And well-meaning, godly Christian people started to press a little bit on what I was teaching, started to clarify some things, asked me to consider some things. It was incredibly helpful. I mean, hard questions, questions that have to be asked when it comes to the topic of life and abortion and, and, and what the church's role in all of that should be. And, and, and so I, I, I learned and, and I read things that were given to me and then I tweaked it and came back the next year and, and preached. I don't know if you caught this, but pretty much the same sermon with some tweaks based on those conversations and then uh, braced again and, and I was not disappointed. Uh, uh, yet again, a, a wave comes in. By that time, I'd learned a little bit more uh, about, hey, here's the filter. Right, if it's just name calling or some random guy from South Carolina can then just stop listening to the podcast, go ahead and delete that. But if they're members, if they were members, let, let's let them through, even if, it's, even if it's nasty, as long as it's not you know, just blatant name calling. I, I, I really am eager to, to feel the weight of these nuances and, and begin to kind of tweak again. And you, you got to answer certain questions. Um, and, and so that, that kind of refined uh, our position on life that, that we have been unapologetic about for well over a decade. And this church has been financially and with volunteer hours and power all the way in on for a long time now. And, and so it's because I believe all of those things that both the Bible as well as science proves that life begins at conception, that I celebrated on Friday the decision of the Supreme Court to reverse the ruling. Now, I did so with a great deal of sobriety. My emotions have been sneaking up on me today. I, I, didn't, I felt great yesterday. I was like, let's do it. And then I literally just got up here this morning and tried to pray with the staff. I'm so I'm having a. I am not naive to how broken and hopeless the world is to some people. I, I don't know what you think we're doing up here during the week. This is a brutally difficult world to be in. And there is a kind of hopelessness that will rot a soul out. There's a young woman, we, we got to lay, there's a young woman that drank bleach to try to kill the baby in her. How hopeless do you have to be to do that? How alone? How nowhere to go? That's what we're talking about here. So it's good and right to celebrate that state or that federal, you know, permission to take life has been lifted and given to the states. But the opportunity now has also been given back to the church to step into a space where darkness can be pushed back and decay can be addressed. And so whether you like the decision or not, I, I want to be straight, I don't care. I don't need you to like the decision. The decision's been made. I think it was a good, right decision. I think it has nothing to do with the gun control thing. That's such a red herring. There, there needs to be common sense gun laws, but in the Constitution of the United States, which is what the Supreme Court is meant to protect, there's an amendment that gives the right. There's not an amendment in the Constitution that gives a right for abortion. It was the right call. I don't need you to agree with me. Uh, I'm going to back off even. That... I, I want to celebrate, but I want to celebrate with sobriety and with a call to action to before you wave those pom-poms, you, you, better, you better understand what's at stake. And, and the moment that we're in, th this had better not be about legislation. This had better be bigger than that for us as the church. I have just found my mind curious of what we might be able to do if more of us actually moved our whole self into the middle of the kingdom of God. And that's why uh, I, I wanted to look at the Sermon on the Mount a little bit this morning. And, and that's what Matthew 5 is. So let me frame this passage, and, and then I want to kind of dive into what now, right? What now? We, we can debate everything I just said before this all you want, but the real question now is, okay, what now? It's done. It's to the states. 
And, and Texas is an extremely conservative state. We'll need to keep an eye on that. We'll need to keep an eye on that. They, they could over tweak this thing and put a lot of people in danger. We need to keep an eye on it. All right. Now, with that said, um, uh, the, before this passage about you being salt and light, we see Jesus in, in, in Matthew 4. You can look up these verses if you want. Uh, verses 23 through 25. He comes preaching the good news of the gospel of the kingdom. That's what Jesus shows up doing. So he shows up in Galilee and he's proclaiming that the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, the kingdom of God is the reign and rule of God. What makes this amazing is that Jesus, before he's crucified, before he resurrects, is coming and declaring victory already. He's like, hey, it's here. The kingdom is at hand. The reign and rule of the creator God of the universe is here in force. It will drive out decay. It will drive out darkness. And light has come into the world. And the darkness will not overcome it. That's what Jesus, he's coming. He's, he's preaching the good news of the kingdom. And then in Matthew, like right before this passage, and then we get to Matthew 5 and you get the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount shows you the upside down nature of the kingdom of God. It shows you what the people of God are going to become by his grace and the power of his Holy Spirit. And it shows you as they become that, what they'll do in the world that God's placed them in, right? So before this passage, you get the Beatitudes, right? The Beatitudes kind of are a well-known thing, even if you're not in church. A lot of you, maybe not even a Christian, you bought something off Pinterest. It's hanging in your living room. It's actually a Beatitude, right? You're like, oh, I didn't even know. I had scripture hanging in my living room, but you do. And yet, when these blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they are used, it's important that we understand actually what's going on in the passage. So right before our passage for the day, when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, he's not saying happy are the poor in spirit. That's a bad reading. It's not the word. He's not saying happy are you when you do these things. He, he, the, the word blessed here is not talking about a subjective feeling that you might have, but rather how God sees what you're walking through as he transforms you into who you will become. So whether you feel blessed as you mourn isn't the question. God sees you and says, congratulations. And he, here's what he says. Think about how different this is than the, the culture at large. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Who gets the kingdom of God? The reign and rule of God, the joy of God, the beauty of God, the power of God. Those who are poor in spirit. What is poor in spirit? No, I can't fix me. I can't fix this world. I'm broken and stuck. God help me. Now listen, this might just set you free this morning. Like what the Bible just said, what Jesus is teaching right out of the gate as what it means to be his people in the kingdom is blessed or congratulations, you're out of gas. Could it be your striving is the very thing robbing you from the kingdom that God wants to establish around you and in you and through you? Blessed are the poor in spirit. God, I can't beat this. I can't overcome this. The world's too broken. What are we going to do? And Jesus is like, congrats, I've got you right where I want you. I mean, how how contrary is that to every, gosh, maybe everything you've ever heard in your church background. Huh? Like how many of us, Christianity, spirit, sprinkle, happiness. Hey, brother, this is, oh, you you out of gas? You didn't finish your Bible reading plan? You, You continue to struggle? You're heartbroken over that? Congratulations. Blessed are you. Yours is the kingdom. Then he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are you when you feel heartsick over your own sin, over the sin of the world. Do you see how this is going to woo us into the decay and darkness of the world? Blessed are you. Congratulations are you when you mourn, when you recognize your own brokenness and you look up and you see the brokenness of the day that you're in. Congratulations. You're going to be comforted that God is going to meet you in that morning as you see the brokenness around you and in yourself. Congratulations comes the voice from heaven 
Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness isn't weakness. I thought about having some fun with that, but I'm just going to leave it there. (laughs) Like Christians aren't called by Jesus to be doormats. Certainly we don't see that in Jesus, but we are power restrained and aimed completely at his kingdom. This means that in all our conversations, if we vilify the other, we will hate the very people that Jesus would have us minister to in his kingdom. This is why for all the political ideologies and even this subject with all the hate and rage around it, if you give in to the compulsion to vilify the other, you will harden your heart to the ways Jesus wants to use you to stop the decay and to push back the darkness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Like, like you get why God would say congratulations on that one? Like I, I am longing in my own life and in the world that I see around me the right ordering of things. Righteousness. I'm hungry for that. Will you rightly order this twisted and broken world? I'm hungry for that, God. And what does he say? You're going to be filled. Now, I will fill you. It's not that there's not hard work ahead. It's that I will fill you. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. Notice, if you look closely, that's not perfect in heart. It's pure in heart. I love that because it it just opens the whole thing up for you to be honest before God. Blessed are the pure in heart. I hate this about me. Will you do something about this? Can I leave this with you? Blessed are the pure in heart, not perfect. Why? They see God. You believe that? Listen, I'm trying. Think of all the energy you spend hiding what you perceive to be unlovely about yourself from God. Hey, look at me. Think of all the energy you spend trying to hide what you think is unlovely about you from God. Listen, that keeps you from seeing God. Blessed are the pure in heart. They see him. Listen, that day when you're finally tired enough of that, and you bring that all before him, you'll receive his love and grace in the kind of transformative way that I plead for you to experience it every time I pray for you. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, not because you're a jerk. Like, oh, they're persecuting me because I'm a Christian. Well, we talked about this in 1 Peter. Sometimes you're getting persecuted because you're a moron <laughs> or because you're a loudmouth or, or because you have not got the right mix of grace and truth. That you lack compassion. This doesn't say, you know, blessed are you when you're persecuted because of your arrogance and pride. This says persecuted for righteousness sake. This also should just dry up any hope we have of being cool and not slandered. Shouldn't it? Like he ain't, he ain't just talking to pastors. Like I'm, I'm telling all our young guys in Acts 29 and the other young pastors, I realize I'm starting to get dad questions and not brother questions anymore. I don't know if anybody's been through that yet. Uh, like I'm, I'm just, that's where I am age wise now. It, it's not like, Hey, what are you guys doing for home group? It, it, you know, home groups at the village. It's more like, Hey, how do you stay in ministry for 20 years without disqualifying yourself? Or does anybody really make it? And I'm like, man, that's a dad. He just asked me a dad question. I'm not old enough to be, Oh my gosh, I am old enough to be dad. <laughs> well, son, you know, and, and one of the things I'm telling them is that Jesus here says to be misrepresented and slandered is a blessing. And yet, yet again, like how many of us are trying to cool our way into influence for the name of Jesus? It's just not going to work. The presence of righteousness is convicting. Gosh, you know this as Christians. You ever been around a Christian who's just more mature than you and you start to feel a little guilty about how you're living life? Anybody? None of you. Wow. Let me, let's start here then. Hang out with different people than you're hanging out with right now. If you're like, no, I'm the moral superiority of my, I am the godliest person I know, then I'm, you're doing it wrong. No, but, I, but I'm wondering, 
as you come across those people, if you don't feel just a quick, you might be able to be mature enough to crush it, but just a little inkling, a little draw towards disqualifying them with some little nuance about their life. And if we feel that and we have the Holy Spirit in us, what's it going to be like when our lives, just by nature that they're there, drop conviction on people that don't know what to do with conviction and find all conviction to be oppressive? Well, you can expect, according to Jesus, to be slandered and misrepresented. Let's just make sure it's because we love Jesus and not because we're jerks, right? Now, from there, we get into our passage. Let's look at it. And you're like, that's a long setup. I know, we're fine. I promise you. We're, gonna be, we're done almost soon. Listen, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So here's where, here's where I'm going. I'm almost done. I'm going to have a friend come out and share just a couple words with you. I'm going to release the fifth grade parents to fifth grade uh, blessing. And, and then we got we to gotta close this thing out. All right? Now, when Jesus shows up preaching the kingdom of God and starts with these beatitudes, he's not, na- hey, these are the kinds of people I'm looking for. He doesn't show up in Galilee and find somebody like this. Are you tracking with me? He doesn't show up and go, oh, look at you. Man, you're poor in spirit. No, Jesus is saying, this is what I'm going to do to you. This is who I'm going to turn you into. The more you're with me, the more poor in spirit you will feel, the more hungry for righteousness you will feel, the more mourning you'll be in because of the brokenness of the world and the brokenness you keep seeing in yourself, the more merciful you'll grow. And from there, as I do that work in you, you will be the salt of the earth. Many meetings here, but primarily you will, look at me, stop the decay around you. You are the light of the world. You will drive out the darkness. You have never swung open a door where there's light and found the darkness pouring into the light room. The light always penetrates out. Darkness never is allowed in. So where we are surrendered fully to Jesus and we are being formed by the Holy Spirit, growing in these things simultaneously, like to be poor in spirit is to mourn. And to mourn it, there's a reason it's ordered like it is. And there's a reason that the first beatitude is theirs is the kingdom. And the last beatitude is theirs is the kingdom. He's saying theirs and theirs alone is the kingdom. But there's this word of warning here. It's a hard one. But if salt loses its saltiness. If light is hidden under a basket, or if you grew up under a bush, oh no. (laughs) Right? I could just tell my church kids there. If you do that, if you do that, then you step out from under the very call of God on your life to stop the decay and darkness all around us. And this is why evangelicalism has such a bad rap. Listen, we've earned being trampled about by the boots of men. For many of us, church is just kind of a didactic experience on Sunday. Like entertain me with a good sermon and give me some good music and keep my kid from getting pregnant out of wedlock, maybe off the drugs. I, I just don't, gosh, join the rotary club. Seriously. That's not what this is. It's not what this is. Like I, 
Like a church fully submitted to Jesus Christ does crazy things. Like, let me give you two examples that I know of. I know of two churches. One is in Fort Lauderdale and one's right outside of DC that have emptied the foster care roles. In fact, the one in Miami, so good at what they do that the government actually gives them hundreds of thousands of dollars to continue to do what they're doing. Like it's funded by the government for this church to eradicate the foster care system and because the foster care system is terribly broken. So these churches and the people therein said, not here. And they stepped into long, brutal, heartbreaking decaying spaces with salt and light. Nothing we're talking about here is easy and nothing we're talking about here is fast. You don't fix this by throwing some diapers at it. No, this is life. So I'm wondering, what can we do? Can we kill the foster care system here in Denton County? Maybe, I don't know. I just don't know. Like, are we in or are we not in? I don't know. But I want us to find out. What does it look like for us? Because as this was given back to the states, it was also given back to the church. We're far more powerful than we think we are. But I do think there needs to be a purging of like where your loyalties actually lie. Nothing about what I'm describing is comfortable or easy or quick. It, you'll get your heart broke. I'm telling you, you'll get your heart crushed. And it'll be worth it because you'll be comforted and you'll mourn the kind of way that leads you into life, not lead you away from it. We will not feed the hungry or care for the most marginalized, tweeting or posturing. No, we'll have to hurt. We'll have to be willing to. So uh, Andrea uh, has worked with Young Lives um, for 12 and a half years. She's kind of moved up the ranks. She's been a member here for a long time. Young Lives works with teenage moms and the fathers. So it's not just the girls and the babies. It's also the fathers. And, and she's done an exceptional job over the years. So will you welcome her? She shares just a little bit with us about, let me leave this for you. Good morning. So I never set out to be a voice for the unborn or unplanned pregnancies, but life has a way of not going as planned. I grew up in Plano in a Christian home in the height of church legalism and the right to life movement. I remember my thoughts around abortion and Planned Parenthood of judgment and disdain, yelling picketers outside of clinics, pictures of unborn babies on the street corners, all the things. Yet, at 19, the summer after my freshman year at Baylor, I found myself in the waiting room of Planned Parenthood. I was awaiting the results of my pregnancy test. The place that had been drilled in my head as the evil place was the only place that I felt like I could turn when I needed help, when I was alone. I remember the nurse coming back into the room and quickly saying, it's positive. It's only by God's grace at that moment that I didn't choose abortion. But it was at that moment that I fully understood how and why you can. I wasn't a murderer. I didn't hate children. But I was desperate. I didn't know how I was going to care for my baby. I also didn't want the outside world, especially the Christian world, to see me as promiscuous. All of that nearly pushed me to end life in secrecy. My story from that waiting room to now has taken many twists and turns. For years, I carried that shame for getting pregnant out of a wedlock, which led to more unhealthy decisions and consequences. But God, in his sovereignty and grace, he was orchestrating a plan and a passion and a purpose for my life. He was birthing inside of me a desire to run after those just like me, the lost, the scared, the hopeless. 
I began feeling the weight of a, as a Christ follower and realizing that when a girl was in a situation like I was, the church was the last place she would turn. It makes no sense when you read the word. This is the actual moment where Christians should enter. This is the moment that the church should be open arms and open doors. For the last 12 years, I've worked for Young Lives, a teen mom and parent outreach program. I've had the privilege to know, love, and serve some of the most amazing people. They found themselves pregnant many times after the innocence of their childhood had been taken. These parents are strong, they're resilient, and they want the best for their children. They've allowed myself and our mentors into their pain. They've allowed us in on their best and their worst days. Last fall, at one of our events, I asked our girls to write on a sticky note what people have said to them. Friends, it crushed my soul. I know it grieved the heart of our Father. The words that had been spoken over to them were vile. They were pure death. From shaming to name calling to wishing death upon them, them or their child. This is a weighty issue. We can all agree on that. Lawmakers cannot change hearts. Lawmakers cannot change hearts to force us to love and serve the vulnerable and the hopeless. Only our Heavenly Father can. Your next steps matter. The church's response matters. This was never just about legislation or being pro-life. It is about how we, the church, step in in love with action. I believe that God is giving us the greatest opportunity to display his love, his lavish, redeeming, restoring love like never before. The issue of life is never gonna be wrapped up with a bow. It's messy, it's hard, it's exhausting, it's heartbreaking, it's long-suffering. Yet our God, he created a way through his own example of sitting with the least of them for crossing barriers of race, culture, and economics to do this work and to do it well. This is not just a baby issue. This is not just a don't have sex issue. So what's next? This work is not just about diapers and wipes. Yet, friends, we need all the diapers and wipes. <laughs> when we love in hard places, the physical needs are evident. We need housing, cars, education, mental health resources. We need all the things. We need more foster families. We need more families that are willing to adopt. We need more families that want to mentor young mothers and fathers. We need resources for job opportunities and training. But above all, we need Jesus. Amen. We need him to show us how to love like he loves. I believe the Lord is calling us at this very moment, church, to get uncomfortable and to do more. It's time for us to step into these hard spaces for the sake of the gospel and for the lives that are at stake. God wants to use you. He wants to use your story. We've been invited to take part in the work that changes lives and generations. Church, now more than ever, the world is watching, watching what we're gonna do next. We must get to work. Isaiah 61, one, for the spirit of the Lord God is upon us because the Lord has anointed us to bring good news to the poor. He set us to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison doors for those that are bound. Amen. Friends, will you join me? Will you come alongside bringing tangible hope to the hopeless? Let's watch what God can do when we get uncomfortable and we say yes. Thank you.
This is going to feel like a weird hard turn. If you are the parent of a fifth grader, today is, wait, what? Today we're doing our fifth grade blessing. We want to mark their transition out of children's ministry and into middle school ministry by blessing them, praying over them, reminding them of who they are and the things they've learned. And so if you're a parent of a fifth grader, uh, I want to just dismiss you to head to KV Maine uh, where you'll start to do that. And I want to just end our time here today. Um, here's what I want to lay before you. Um, there has to be space for us to celebrate and simultaneously acknowledge the heartbreak here. There, there has to be that space. And so if you're here today and this is touching you in, in a place that, that ben, you have tried to keep defended and guarded for a long time. Listen, we have worked really hard to be a safe place for you. Um, we, we, <laughs> we worked really hard. Like the, the step that you would need to take this morning is heal. Listen, you have not out sinned the grace of God. Right. You, have not, you have not lived in a kind of way where he would turn his face to you. Well, the Bible is just filled with him pulling from the darkest places, those who would become his brightest light. I don't know of anyone involved in this very hard work that doesn't, I mean, you heard it in Andrea's story, right? I found myself in, in Planned Parenthood and, and, and I found myself pregnant. And, what, and then what happened? So what the enemy means for her destruction, what did Jesus do? He flipped it on its head and weaponized it against him. And, and man, you, you don't have, blessed are the pure in heart they'll see God. Maybe for the first time ever, you need to finally do business with those places inside of you that are broken. Maybe you had one, an abortion, or you've funded one, or you pushed somebody to, and it's just gnawed away, and you've kept, nobody, nobody knows. You've just been carrying that. You don't have to carry that. And so, man, we, we've got embrace grace groups here. We, we've got all sorts of opportunities. You have to heal. That would be my encouragement. Like you, you don't need to run off and sign up to volunteer yet. We, we need to get that soul healthy. We need to get some hooks out of you and, and some truth into you. And, and then man, let's go get it. But, but I want to encourage you. You will, you will not be disparaged or hated here for your backstory. This is a grimy place. I, I hope it always will be. The day we get really pretty, I need to go do something else, right? So, but there are like grace abounds. That's post, it's a post abortion Bible study every Wednesday night at recovery. It just walks you through uh, like, what does it mean? And if you find yourself in an unwanted pregnancy, we we've got, um, we've got, uh, embrace grace groups for you. There are all these spaces where you can step in and begin to heal. And I want to encourage you to do that. If none of that sounds like it works, just email care at the village church.net and someone will reach out and, and we want to come alongside and, and help you heal. Now, for the rest of us. This cannot be for us a moment of adrenaline. Do you know what I mean by that? Uh, adrenaline's a quick burst of, uh, of energy that your body gives you when you're in fight and flight mode. For us, this can't be for the next month. We're going to really think about that. This has to become for us. We understand that God has called us to be salt and light to have dirty hands in the decay and to be right in the middle of darkness, shining the light. We understand that means poverty of spirit. That, that means we're growing and mourning and hungering and thirsting for righteousness and growing in mercy. And you grow in mercy by having your mercy tested. You track it with me? Yeah. Uh, we don't talk enough about that. You know, you grow in mercy, you get your mercy tested. You, know, you grow in compassion, you get it tested. And so what we've tried to put together for you today is just an opportunity to start getting involved in these spaces. Is out in the foyer are the ministries that we have partnered with. They, we didn't start doing this because of the Dobbs case on Friday. Like we've been active in this space for well over a decade. You have raised millions of dollars. You, you have um, provided um, ultrasound machines. You've created a mobile clinic. You, you've done all sorts of work and I'm going, great. It's just, the, just scratching the surface. 
And so all sorts of ministries that we support, that, that we love, and that we would say you could get involved in this are out in the foyer. So I want to get you out of here so you can spend some time looking through those, getting involved where you're able to get involved. And then if none of that, like if you've got an extra, I don't want you to get overwhelmed by the darkness of our day. All God has asked of you is faithfulness where you are. You try, you got to solve the world's problems. You got to be faithful where you are. You don't need to worry about kind of big picture this. You just need to be faithful where you are. If you've got an open bedroom, how, how might you use that? Uh, around Thanksgiving and Christmas, if you've got an open table, how might you use that? If you've got enough money to, to, to give, then do that. We just talked about generosity. This is where that comes into play. Like, what does it look like? For us to be salt and light. And I, I need to, what does it look like for you to be salt and light? To be in the decay of it, in the darkness of it, but to be shining like light and stopping the decay from growing. This is why Christians should never be bored. And this is why we should need Holy Spirit strength to live into the life He gave us. I, here's my, if what you want is didactic, good teaching and not to be in the fight, I, I love you. I'd rather you go somewhere else. There are great churches around here and I'm not trying to shame anyone. I'm just going, I, I want to be with people who are in the trench and want to work like 10 years ago. I could have never imagined that it, Roe v. Wade would be overturned 10 years ago. That was Mount Everest. But when the people of God pray and hustle, goodness sakes, what, what won't be done? I'm, I'm going long. So let me pray and give you time to linger out there. Father, I bless these men and women. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you that you picked us up out of the muck and the mire, that you've cleaned us off, that you've set our feet on a rock, that you've put a hymn of praise in our mouth, a hymn of praise to you, our God. Help us. We, we can see the darkness around us. Let us not shrink back. Let us not be bullied and overrun, but let us live lives of beauty and grace. Let us be bold where you've placed us. And let us be faithful over a long period of time and let you produce the fruit that you will in season. We love you and trust you. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.